So this is a 52-year-old male admitted to the hospital with heart failure. He was actually class four. He had no prior history of whatsoever from a cardiovascular standpoint, but he had several CV risk factors, so CKD, diabetes, and hypertension. And over the course of a year, he went from class one to class four. So here you can see his physical exams. He had an enlarged pulsatile liver, had two plus leg edema, and at the base, he had an early systolic ejection murmur with an increased P2. And then at the apex, he had a whole systolic murmur with an S3. Now, of course, the patient came to the echo lab, and you can see the peristernal long axis on the left. You can see that the ventricle was dilated and the function is reduced. The auric valve is thickened, and when we went ahead and measured the ventricle, that confirmed that the ventricle was dilated. So it was 55 millimeters in end diastole, which for him was mildly dilated. You can also see that the RV is dilated and the function is a little bit down. Now we're gonna zoom into the mitral valve here because of that systolic murmur. And you can see here that the mitral valve is thickened and then there's a jet of MR that is posteriorly directed. And also if you focus on the origin of that jet, it's a little bit unusual and we're gonna, we're gonna look at this further. So here's the short axis view on the left. You can see that the mitral valve has an unusual appearance. And then when we put color Doppler on, you can see that that posteriorly directed jet also originates from a funny spot. So based on the echo images, what would you say that the mechanism of MR is? So it was anterior prolapse leading to that posteriorly directed jet, ischemic MR, or this is a mitral valve cleft. Please go ahead and vote. Excellent. So you don't need a session at all. So you're absolutely right. That's a mitral valve cleft. And again, the key for the diagnosis, when you zoom into the mitral valve, you can see that actually the anterior leaflet is, is split into two. And then when you sample with color Doppler, the jet is originating from the cleft itself. So very typical findings of a mitral valve cleft. Now we're gonna move to the apical images and I've flipped the images to match the non mayo format. So on the left-hand side, then you have the LV to the left. And then when we put color Doppler, we see quite a bit of flow flowing in an unusual way. LV on the right, you mean? Yeah, to the left, yeah, you're right, on the right. Just force, check. Force of habit, force <laughs> of habit, yeah. Should have kept in the male format, but thank you. Now what's the final diagnosis? So putting it all together, is an isolated mitral valve cleft, is a partial AV canal, or this is a complete AV canal? Very good, so partial AV canal. Now just going over the options here, so an isolated mitral valve cleft is, is very rare and there's some other features here suggesting that there's more to the story. And a complete canal comes with a VSD, so a patient at age 52, if the patient had an unrepaired complete canal, you would see Eisenmenger syndrome. So this has to be a partial AV canal. And when we go back to the, the apical images here, you can see that the hallmark of a partial AV canal, you can see that both AV valves, they sit on the same level. And people have described this, this as a common valve with two orifices. So again, the key for the diagnosis is to see that both tricuspid and mitral valves are on the same plane. And now on the right-hand side, as we put color Doppler, you can see that they're shunting across the atrial septum in its inferior portion. So this is very typical for a primum defect. So valves on the same level, and then you have this shunting that happens in the lower part or more apical part of the atrial septum, if you will. Now you can see the same thing from the subcostal view. So you can see the defect, again, is in the lower part of the septum. And then as we put color Doppler, you see all this flow crossing the atrial septum, so a very large left to right shunt in the lower part of the atrial septum, typical for a primum defect. And on the left-hand side, you can appreciate how the two valves, they sit on the same level, so typical for a primum defect. So this is the summary of the echo, so partial AV canal with a large left to right shunt, cleft mitral valve with severe MR, mild LV enlargement with 
mildly reduced EF. That was moderate RV enlargement, which is not surprising with that big shunt, with mild increase in RVSP, and there was also moderate TR. Before I move forward, I think the question is, why, why is the LV abnormal? Is it severe MR? Is it because of the large atrial level shunt? Or do we have superimposed ischemic heart disease? Please go ahead and vote. So most of you said severe mitral regurgitation. So some said atrial level shunt with very few ischemic heart disease. So here you can see his angiogram, and I think we've all learned this the hard way. So congenital heart disease in adults is typically seen accompanied by something else. So just make sure that you go through your typical things in terms of LV dysfunction. Just keep your diagnosis broad. So you can see three vessel disease with, with typical appearance of, of diabetic vessels. And as we go back to the options, so severe MR leading uh, up to diastolic, up systolic dysfunction rather, typically you would see the ventricle being very big. So typically the ventricle gets very big before it gets weak. So that's why we intervene based on LV dimensions. And then atrial level shunting has been implicated in LV diastolic dysfunction, but not in LV systolic dysfunction. So we felt that a lot of the systolic dysfunction was actually because of superimposed three vessel um, um, coronary disease. So then, again, putting this all together, what to do, and I think it was pretty clear. I think the patient needed surgery, and he's scheduled for surgery next month. It's going to be a high-risk operation, but I don't think there's any doubt that the patient needs surgical intervention. Now, let's just go over partial AV canal. So it's the so-called Austin primum defect. There's a large ASD typically, but there's no VSD. That's the difference between the complete or the transitional, for example. So partial AV canal, no VSD. Mitral valve is universal, so the mitral valve is also abnormal, and they're also prone to having LVOT obstruction. That can be because of fibrous bands or because the LVOT is small, so there are several different mechanisms, but also interrogate the LVOT in a partial canal. And on the right-hand side, you can see a gross specimen, and the arrow points to that large, low-lying uh, ASD. And as I mentioned, the cleft mitral valve is universal, so when you look at the pathology specimen, that's how it looks, and it looks just like what we see by TTE. And this is what you would expect if you were to 3D it, so you can see this, this triangular-shaped mitral valve, typical for a cleft mitral valve, and if you were to put Doppler, the, the jet comes from where the cleft is. I just want to touch upon mitral regurgitation AV canals because that's the most common scenario that we're faced with in adults. Typically, they have a repair of their canal early on, and they come back for follow-up, and they have mitral regurgitation. So this is data from Mayo, and when we looked at the most common to be reoperated, mitral regurgitation is actually the most common cause. So just keep that in mind that they might come back with residual mitral regurgitation, especially if the cleft wasn't closed. That's why at Mayo, 80% of the patients will have primary closure at the time of repair just to avoid recurrent mitral regurgitation down the road. And there's a great example. So there's a 20-year-old patient that I recently saw. She was repaired at age four. She's done great, but as you can see here, she has quite a bit of MR. It's been described as moderate to severe versus severe. The LV is indeed dilated, but the other thing that we see, which is very typical, there's also a component of inflow obstruction. So when we sampled the mitral valve, the gradient was three. So typically they have some degree of inflow, which of course, affects their candidacy for repair. So you just got to keep in mind that most often this is mixed disease with inflow and regurge. But now in a patient like this, for example, she's asymptomatic. In fact, she just delivered a baby boy, and then she did great. What would you recommend? So she has known severe MR with a dilated ventricle. Would you say observation, mitral repair, or should we go ahead and replace the valve? So most of you said mitral valve repair. Interesting, I was not expecting that. I think that brings us up to the question, how should we manage MR in a canal, or how should we manage MR in an adult congenital population? And, and surprisingly, there are very um, um, few papers out there trying to support data. And then when you don't know what to do, you go back to the guidelines, and this is what the American guidelines would say. These are the ACHD guidelines. 
And interestingly, they say you should manage MR in a congenital patient just like how you manage primary MR, how you manage MR in an acquired heart disease patient, which I always find a bit controversial or, or counterintuitive, I should say, because they're completely different. And too bad Nish is not here, but when you look at the guidelines, they, they keep harping on, on this important aspect of mitral repair, that it needs to be done at low mortality with a higher uh, um, repair rate, so it should be greater than 95%. And when you think about someone who's had cardiac surgery that has an intrinsically abnormal valve, it's hard to, to conceive that low mortality with a high repair rate. So you, gotta, you have to keep that in mind, that your patient might go to the OR expecting a repair, and they might come out with a replacement. And when we look at the outcomes of, of the re reoperations, I mean, this data from the same paper, you can see here that although the p-value is not significant, the repair group did much better. So if your patient goes for a replacement, you, the, the outcome might not be the same. And when you look at the breakdown here, numbers-wise, was half and half. And then if we're borrowing data from the acquired heart disease literature, this reminds me of this. So when we look at the acquired mitral valve, population, replacement is translated into worse survival. So just keep in mind, in your canal patients that are doing very well, maybe they're better off um, left alone. And in fact, this patient has been followed uh, for many years and her MR has remained stable. And again, as I said, she just delivered a baby boy without any trepidation. Now, I think just, I just wanted to, to finish with this. And I think this also highlights the congenital heart disease and acquired heart disease are different. This is the mayor experience. Our fellow just looked at this. And it was interesting, when we looked at canals with significant MR, you can see here that the ventricles were much smaller. So again, if you're, if you're borrowing the criteria for acquired heart disease, uh, you might have a problem because they're not truly applicable to, uh, to patients with congenital heart disease. So you can see, again, the ventricle was bigger, but still much smaller than what you would expect, for example, in prolapse. The RVSP was the same, but the LA was bigger. So again, there might be some repercussion for the atrium, but not necessarily for the ventricle. And also, the other thing to point out is that the EF was, was lower than even in the patients with, with more than moderate MR. So again, be careful borrowing the criteria from the acquired heart disease world. So just to summarize, so whenever you see a cleft mitral valve, think about unrepaired AV canal in an older adult. MR post AV canal repair is the most common reason for reoperation. They commonly have mitral disease that is mixed, so MR with some degree of MS, which might affect how we proceed surgically. And I really think that we need more data in congenital patients to know how to manage this tough population.